just introduce yourself and say what your role was in the military, like literally what your trade was, like in a, in a, in a sentence or whatever? Uh, yeah, so I'm um, Nicholas Green, a retired corporal from uh, the combat engineers in the Canadian Army. I was uh, with 4ESR. They were my unit in Gagetown, 4 Engineer Support Unit, and uh, I was trained first primarily as uh, an EROC operator. Um, EROC is Expedient Route Opening Capability. Uh, they are the guys that, like, we, we trained to leave the base. What our job was, sorry, we would leave the base in the morning before all the other troops, and we would sweep the roads and the routes that the rest of the troops would be taking for IEDs and make, deem them safe, take all the bombs of the road. Uh, so that it was safe for our guys to travel back and forth. So that was our job. Um, I wasn't trained in the detection vehicle, but I was trained as a driver and uh, as a VPS dismounted searcher of vulnerable, sorry, vulnerable point search is what it's called. So I was actually one of the guys on the ground looking in culverts and you know what I mean? Looking for the bombs or whatever. What was what was your understanding and your colleagues' understanding of why you were going overseas? Um, well, that I mean, okay. The the military did at the time present every one of their briefs. They present like a mission statement, and they say what the mission is. Right? Um, it's I don't specifically remember to be honest in each brief what the mission statement was. So Long I'm time not ago. saying I'm not putting any words in their mouth or anything like that. Um, but <laughs> as far as why we thought we were there, it was literally, man, you could ask any troop on the ground and they give you a different reason. Like a couple of groups of guys, like, you know what I mean? Buddies that hung out together would have a general consensus. Like we're here to help the people. Um, other people, what you would talk to would say, we're here to find, we're here to fight terrorists. Um, we're here to find Osama bin Laden or other people were here. It's all about the oil. It's. You know what I mean? There was no, nobody was really sure we were just there. And once we got there, everybody, I think it was easier for us once we were there to just tell ourselves we were there to help the people. We were there to help the people. But really, we didn't know why we were there helping those people. There's people all over the world that we're getting. So anyway, yeah, it wasn't particularly clear as to why we were there. Helping the people anyway, helping to get rid of the terrorists. Uh, I think a good question to ask would be, why don't you tell us a little bit about like when you first arrived there and then try to talk generally about so talk about the arrival maybe and then talk generally about your experience your day to day work like going back to what you already mentioned about Iraq and stuff um, so arrival and then day to day okay um, so when we first got there <clears throat> as soon as we got off the plane it was like I don't know 2 in the morning or whatever um, you get there and you're awake for like I forget the exact hours, but you're awake for a long, you had already been traveling to Afghanistan, right? You get off the plane and it's briefs, passport hand in, document checks, kit issue, wham, wham, wham. You're going, you're going here, going there, being shuffled to the next place. You got to put cross all the T's and dot all the I's to make sure you're checked into the country. You get all your equipment and you're ready for war. So for the first two days, let's say you're, it's just go, 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 go. But it's not combat, go, go, go. You're learning the drills, what to do. Like when the rocket attacks come into base, you're learning the safe zones, you're learning the rules of the camp. You're just getting familiar, familiarized yeah, with, with the camp and you're getting pumped through the system. Um, Sorry, where, where, where did you arrive? Kandahar Airfield, right in the main CAF, um, where all the countries are. Um, so we stayed a couple, a day or two there. Uh, and then after a day or two there, some, half of our troop was flown out on a helicopter to the forward operating base, Massengar, that we were at. And the other half went with um, the EROC crew that we were replacing to learn the route from the main base to the FOB and to learn a couple of the drills, how they had adjusted them from Canada to Afghanistan. Because we would get briefed the night before, everybody knew the routes, and then at sunup we would leave and clear these routes in the morning uh, to make sure that they were safe. And we would go until either the mission was done or sometimes we would get called out. Anyway, we would do our routes until the sun went down. 
because you couldn't work when the sun went down because it's too dangerous. You can't see trip wires. You can't see ID indicators. You can't see people looking at you from over a wall. It's just too dangerous. So as the sun went down, we would get back to either our fob or if it was too far away, we would stay at another fob that was closer to where we were, get briefed on the next day's mission and go again. Some days you're in earlier, some days you're in later. And uh, yeah, that was pretty much it from a mission standpoint from what we were doing every day. What was most memorable about the work you did on route clearance? Uh, what was an eventful day like? What was a boring day like? Were you driving? Were you walking? A mixture, just literally the kind of like nitty gritty of the nuts and bolts of what you were doing on a patrol. Okay. Um, well, every day was different. Um, and like I said, the guys that I worked directly under were really good about taking care of our welfare. So they would never let you, like, even if I felt like I wanted to be on the ground for two weeks straight, they wouldn't let me because it's not healthy, it's not safe, it's not good on your brain or your body. So you were getting rotated around a lot between being on the ground, being a driver, um, being a camera guy. And we had enough guys to, we were lucky, it wasn't like a break day, but it kind of was because you weren't out looking for bombs. Um, where we had enough guys in our rotation where we could leave two guys behind us on camp sentry and they would do camp maintenance, do camp patrol prep meals, yada, yada, help anybody around the base, help with the sergeant majors and stuff. And like I said, it's it's not a break because you're still in the war zone, but it's it's a break because you're not out pounding the ground looking for bombs, right? Um, so, yeah, you could be driving, running the camera. But uh, if you're on the ground, um, your day-to-day -day was you would sit on a bench about as wide as this couch. Well, or sorry, there's three seats, and the area it took out was about as wide as this couch or whatever. They were small individual seats that had six-point harnesses and headrests. They were free from floating from the floor so that if you got blasted, it wouldn't rock you or whatever. There was three seats here and three seats across from you um, in a vehicle called a Cougar. And we would sit in there, all kitted up, um, and drive between vulnerable points. So what would happen is there was detection vehicles in front of us called Huskies. And they would go up the route with metal detectors and another type of technology. I don't know how much I'm allowed to say. So oh, yeah. they were Whatever detection vehicles. Can, yeah. They would detect the bombs in the ground. And anytime they had a hit or whatever, we would investigate it. Or anytime we came to a vulnerable point, we would investigate that. So what that would entail is like anytime we had to do an investigation. So you would dismount from your vehicle. You unclip from your six-point harness. Open your back door. The convoy stopped in the middle of the road. You deploy and go out to the sides of the road and do your drills and search the area for bombs, search the area for any threat, whatever it could be. If it was nothing, you had a specific set of drills where you would return back to the vehicle. You're always changing it up so the enemy doesn't know what you're doing. Um, get back in the vehicle, strap in, lock the doors. Everybody's good to go. Everybody light a cigarette, move on to the next vulnerable point. Uh, and like you literally, it could have been 500 meters between them. It could have been a kilometer it could have been five kilometers so some days you were get in buckle up by the time you're buckled up unbuckle your back out of the door and you're searching but other days or even at other points in the day you get in buckle up and you'd be sitting for an hour and a half driving through the desert detecting like trying not to fall asleep uh, so on a non-eventful day it was just like i said you'd just be Hiring a stop, in and out of the vehicle, doing your drills, sweating, eating rations, smoking darts, chilling with the boys, listening to music in the back. And on eventful days, I don't know, there's a, there was different eventful days, obviously, but the, the thing for me is, um, I don't know, literally, I don't know how much I can say because I, in the military, had, and I'm not like, <laughs> I'm yeah. just saying, I had a top secret clearance to stuff that I don't know what civilians are allowed to know you know yeah, what i mean neither do I, so um like what was an eventful day that you can remember that you can talk about like what was the time <laughs> where you did have to clear stuff or you, you know, um, if you can talk about anything like, well uh i remember one of the first finds i was on the ground for that's an easy one to describe uh no i wasn't on the i wasn't on the ground for the find story i was driving a t-lav my buddy adam was on the ground and it was like regular we were going through an area that we've known was like high threat or whatever and uh he just like we were all just chilling sitting and like the guys in the vehicle you have like intercoms you can talk back and forth while you're watching your action shit so you don't go crazy and bored anyway over the radio we just heard like yeah guys i got something and um uh, we just heard 
the ensuing conversation between Adam and the sergeant. And Adam just like carried on because you're obviously you can't let the enemy know that you're like, Oh Jesus, I'm mom. <laughs> uh, so we like carried on and did the appropriate drills and we got the information. And so for that one, uh, that was like a, a, a boring eventful day because what we did, and that's good. That's what you want. A boring <laughs> day in Afghanistan because we found an explosive that was set up for, um, a patrol that was supposed to come through there, like an, an infantry patrol. It was a known route that they always took. And it was a DFC, a directional frag charge set up across a bridge that definitely would have nailed them. You know what I mean? So we found that. And what we had to do for that particular one, because it was new or whatever, we set up what was called a cordon. We just cordoned off the area so nobody could get in. And we waited all day with our guns facing out, watching the area until EOD, American Explosive Ordnance Disposal, could show up. And they took a look at it, got all the information, did what they needed to do, and then we took off and went home. So that was like a eventful because we found something, but not eventful because nothing like crazy happened, which is good, right? Um, but then there's other eventful days where like you're driving, opening roads that haven't been driven on in like months by the battle group, and we were the first guys on them, and we we got hit. Like, we just exploded. <laughs> it was the vehicle that I was in. Um, obviously, nobody saw it coming. Everybody did what they were supposed to properly. It just, sometimes it's a war zone. Sometimes the other guys get you, right? But luckily for us, nobody got fucking hurt. The vehicle did really well. Uh, after that, we got out and searched, made sure that everybody was safe. There was no other immediate threats. We carried on and kept doing our mission for the rest of the day. So those are two types of really eventful days, yeah. They're pretty eventful, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think uh, it would be good if you... Would you mind talking about your experiences with Afghan people? So, like, civilians, um, if you had any civilians, Afghan National Army, Afghan National Police, any of those people. What it, what kind of interactions you had with people in Afghanistan? Uh, probably, a, probably a variety. So if you want to talk about just your impression of, of your... Of your um, of your interactions with them and your impression of the, of the people, I guess. <clears throat> uh, I don't know, man. That's like a tough question, I guess, because, well, like I can tell you about the interactions. We were in and around them all day, every day. Um, they were on the base. Uh, the civilians were working for and with the Canadian government. Um, we had uh, interpreters that we worked with every day. We worked with the ANA, the AMP, civilian contractors. When we were out in the streets, you talk to kids, you give them candy, water. You want to win the hearts and the minds of the people, so you're good to them. You used to talk to village elders. You you know what I mean? You meet and greet people, but at the same time, obviously, you got to be cautious. Um, well, the interpreters, for the most part, like they were all really good because they're hired by the Canadian government. they got to go through a strict selection process, and uh, they get screened, and they're actually like, they hate the Taliban, and they hide from the Taliban. Most of them are doing it to get their families out of the country, right? Um, so for that, for the most part, they were fine. Obviously, there's some strange cultural differences at times, but they were fine, nice guys or whatever. Um, and as and the ANA and the AMP, man, I don't know. I don't have very, very many fond things to say about them fellows because they, <clears throat> from my experience, we they were supposed we were supposed to be working with the ANA and the AMP, the Afghan National Army and the Afghan. National Police. Um, we were supposed to be working with them, training them in our ways of like finding bombs and our combat techniques and whatever, training them to fight um, the Taliban. But there's so there's so much corruption in the country and right in the ANA and the AMP that um, so many of them were just literally working for the highest bidder. So they're like, oh yeah, Canada, thanks for the hundred bucks a day or the fifty bucks a day or whatever it is, like. Thank you very much. And then the Taliban come this way and like, hey, we'll give you 75 bucks a day if you do this or if you get in a gunfight with the Canadian or you don't arrest this guy when he goes through a certain checkpoint or whatever. So it's so corrupt that I I can't give a fair judgment because one someday you'd see guys and they'd be like, eh, and they'd come over and like stand and have smokes with you and stuff or whatever on camp. And then other days, like I literally, I was in a turret one day and a guy was like, like flipping me off and stuff. And I was like that. And he turned and like cocked his fucking cocked his 50 cal machine gun at him i was like right on buddy so i fucking cranked the turret right over and cranked it at him i was like let's do this and came over the radio i was like 
Everybody in the fucking turrets pointed at that fucking A and A. He might open up fire. He's just threatening me with this fucking weapon. Like, and all the boys are like, chee, 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 chee. and the boy, like the vehicle stopped, and we were all pointing at him. They're like, and fucking got out of there. But you know what I mean? Who do you trust? I don't go very much. I don't have very much nice to say about either of them. So, yeah, but you did work with them, and there's a little bit of variety of experience. Like you had, you met some guys who, as far as you could see, were probably working with working with you guys or wanting to work with you or yeah. welcome the training and then you had people who were pointing 50 cows at you yeah i mean so. like at the end of the day they're just people over there you know what i mean but because they've been subjected to shit for so long and their ancestry is well and compared to what i what i consider shit anyway for so long war-torn bullshit they just i don't know there's a lot more corruption and stuff corruption's a lot easier than it would be than it is here, I guess. Yeah, fair enough. And what about, um, so what kind of, this is the last thing I'll kind of ask you about this, but what sort of interactions did you have with civilians? Was it mainly trying to keep civilians out of areas or were, did, did you sometimes have to, were you talking with people like, you know, women, children, stuff like that? Was it just, was it just trying to keep everybody safe or what kind of yeah, interactions did you Ag- have? Again, um, that varied that everything. We had things hey, how's it going, to people trying to sell you stuff, to we would talk to people in markets, to kids would come up and you would talk with them and high five and we'd do like karate moves and, you know what I mean, play with them or like whatever. Um, And women, it was always fun to like wave at them because they're like, ooh, whatever and stuff, you know what I mean? Um, And even the men, sometimes they would come up and shake your hand and say like, thank you. But then the next day, you could see the same group, the literally the same kids that you were just like, ah, and like giving candy to, and they'd be like, fuck you, fuck you, Taliban, fuck Canada, like, so, and then you'd see them a day later, and like, if you give them candy, they were your best friends again, so, everything, man, we were, I don't know. <laughs> kids, or kids, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's and one thing, and kids in a war zone, and just something kids else, Kids in right? war zone, like, I don't know, like, what do you do? Yeah. Somebody gives you candy, and you're cool, but then somebody comes over and gives you a PlayStation and candy and says, don't like the guys that give you just candy. I'm going to like the PlayStation and candy. I'm a little kid, man. Like, yeah, no, so. exactly. Um, so do you, uh, do you, are you all right with, or could you tell us anything about some of the, some of the other stuff that was going on while you were there with the, with the Canadian forces? Like, was there a lot of, was there a lot of action happening while you were there? Were, a lot, were people taking fire regularly? Or what sort of, what was the kind of overall, did you get a sense of how the forces were doing or what the forces were doing while you were there? Like an environment, are you hearing reports every day about so-and-so, these guys got in trouble or these guys did a good job? Oh, here? yeah, oh, yeah. So like, what was the It act? was a war zone, you know, um, not to cut you off, but huh. uh, every, all day, every day, the radio was going off. There's a, a tick here, or an ID here, a find here, or a suspicion here, or, and it was all day and all night. There was bombs dropping, and you could hear gunfire in the distance. And you talk to the boys at the end of the day, and if you weren't in the shit, they were. And you just, I don't know. Sorry, I got off track, but I like cut you off because I was like, yeah, man, like all day it was. You were in a fucking war zone, you know. You'd be chilling, having. It'd be your break day or whatever, and you'd be up like cooking up barbecue, like taking your ration out. And, grilling it instead of fucking eating it cold or whatever barbecue uh and the tank would be going off sniper tank hill would be going off just cracking or you'd hear 50 cal going off somewhere like it was awesome man <laughs> that stuff was cool uh but yeah you could definitely had a feel that we were in the war zone and shit was going down uh, as for the mission itself i knew and i felt that um uh, canada was getting out of there um which was good in my opinion because you're on the last place. rotation. Is we're, that right? we're on the last combat rotation. Yeah. Um, and like so much so that like our area had gotten so small, uh, the area that Iraq was responsible for was only like 15 square kilometers when I was there, but even still in that 15 square kilometer radius, that AO, there was shit going down every day. You know what I mean? Um, so anyway, like, yeah, at the end of it, we got out of there. We even, like, the Americans took over the base, took over our sleeping quarters where we were staying and everything. So, um, I don't know. Do you want to talk a little bit about, uh, like, I know, because <clears throat> the only interactions I had with you, sometimes we'd do phone calls. You'd call. That was great. Mm-hmm. And I've sent you a couple of packages with, like, comics and stuff in them. Yeah. So, what, can you talk a little bit about what your downtime was like there? And if you were in FOBs or wherever you were? 
Uh, yeah, no, pretty much any downtime that we had, uh, we just kept busy. Um, we only had a certain number of minutes per week that we could use on the phone. That's why, I don't know, you got calls like once a month or whatever it was because I had to make sure mom was getting updated regularly. Um, so a lot of downtime spent like, just shooting the shit with the boys. You would play cards. Uh, we smoked a lot of cigarettes, <laughs> a lot of cigarettes. Um, played cards, like poker every night. Watched a lot of movies. Everybody got care packages sent to them with movies in it. So we watched movies and, um, I don't know, cleaned weapons and did army stuff. A lot of the time actually was spent working out because our, like the engineer hill that we claimed inside the base, we built a base or we built a gym basically attached to our sleeping quarters so we just like work out two or three four times well four is getting a bit ambitious but two or three times a day um just because it was right there you just go and do workouts and eat food and i don't know shoot the ship play catch it was just like try and pretend you're not in the war zone time right and sometimes if you had to be an ffo while you're doing it like the boys would be out having fucking squirt gun fights uh and their full fighting order, you know what I mean? Full combats and, and bulletproof vests and helmets and goggles and gloves, having water fights, throwing balloons at each other and stuff. You just, you can't think about it, right? Yeah. And playing Xbox. Playing right? Xbox, playing, oh man, my buddy Matt got uh, a GameCube, uh, an N64, and, and what was the other thing that he got sent? Oh, an Xbox 360 over. And all of us ended up like going on this crazy... Uh, gamer rage in our downtime at one point for a couple months where everybody had xbox 360s in the room and we all like bought a hub from the american px and like had wires running through a tent and had them all plugged in together so we could play call of duty against one another and stuff like in a war zone everybody sitting in their tents like uh, killing each other um but yeah so we did stuff like that too which was pretty fun i played quite a bit of dead space in afghanistan which was cool anyway yeah so we, we had lots to occupy our time anyway. What do you think was the result of Canadians' involvement in Afghanistan? What was the result of Canada's involvement in Afghanistan? What was people's opinion of the whole conflict, you know, 10 years on? If you can remember, it's years ago uh, for you. You want, I don't know, like you want people, people's opinion, people that, I can't speak for anybody else. Speak That's for yourself. I, then, yeah, you know, I just sure, have yeah. to speak for myself. I can't say what anybody else has said or anything. Uh but for me, what what did Canada accomplish for being in Afghanistan in ten years? Uh, what what's the body count for Canadian troops? One hundred and sixty. Yeah, I'm right around there. One hundred and sixty, whatever. One hundred and sixty-two, one hundred and sixty-three, whatever it is. That many dead soldiers. That's what that fucking war was about. Not what it was about, but that's what we accomplished, man. Because look over there. Um, we were having a discussion not long ago about this. Look over there right now. The civilian casualty numbers are higher. The war's still happening. ISIS and Taliban are fighting over there. What the fuck did we do? Lost a bunch of boys for I don't know what. <laughs> really? Like, it sounds cold or whatever, but it's fucking... I don't know. I don't know. if it's, It doesn't seem like it's better over there to me. You know what I mean? So... <laughs> yeah. No, it's good. I, I'm not good at asking questions, but yeah, that's... What I mean was, what was, what's your opinion of it? Because you're obviously looking back. So what would, uh, so what was coming back uh, to Canada like for you at the end of the tour? Uh, and we, and you can go right into talking about what your life's been like since you got back, basically. Anything you want to say about it? Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Uh, I don't know. Um, when I first got back, it was like obviously the best fucking thing ever because <laughs> I was back home in Canada where people weren't trying to kill me all the time. Um, I had a lot of money. Um, I was on top of the world, man. I, everybody I loved was around. I had a new appreciation for life. Like it changed me for the better in that way, I would say. Like I, since Afghanistan, I, like really appreciate my family and my friends like my close friends the people that i love and care about like my circles become a lot s smaller and a lot more meaningful to me um it did teach me that uh but anyway sorry when i got back it was like yeah i was on top of the world i just spent money and drank with my buddies and fucking did whatever i wanted all the time and traveled and yeah it was great i was home uh, and then slowly after that unbeknownst to me 
I got like worse and worse. Um, because like, anyway, I won't go into detail about it or whatever, but my like PTSD, apparently like I had it, I had no idea that I even had it. It got worse and worse over the next couple of years. And I got like, um, I became like an alcoholic. I was drinking every night and like, got like, would get like loud and not, a, not, not abusive or anything, but like violent in the sense that I would like punch holes through walls and like, you know, like wake up screaming and just having a hard time and shit. So uh my life spiraled pretty hard for a while after that and i didn't know why uh finally mom talked me into like going and not she didn't talk me into i I talked to her and told her i felt like something was wrong with me and she like told me she was like yeah like i'm glad you brought it up because there's dad and i have noticed for like two years that there's been something up with you so anyway i like went and got help and at that point was on my way out of the military I got diagnosed then uh, with PTSD and major depressive disorder. uh, And that's had answered so many questions as to like what was going on with me. And, but nobody at work had, had known because I didn't, uh, I didn't want to, there's like a stigma behind PTSD and MDD and like any non-physical injury, any injury you can't see in the military sort of um, at the time. I felt like it would hinder my career if anybody knew that this shit was going on. And my life was about the military, so I didn't want to, I just wanted to go forward, right? Um, So anyway, I put all that aside after I got diagnosed and finally realized that there was something was wrong. I was already on my way out of the military when I started getting help with it. Um, And uh, since then, I've got help with it. And uh, I I battled with like, pills and all that shit substance abuse a little bit and uh, alcoholism and stuff again and uh, i got pat i moved past all that through like natural more naturalistic ways and therapy and through my super close support group and then uh, with the introduction of medical marijuana uh that changed my fucking life like literally i was on the brink of fucking like insane depression and suicide and stuff and like I had the worst life ever and then I got introduced to medical marijuana and it changed my fucking life like and since then yeah sorry <clears throat> since then things have been like unreal so good uh like I have a zest for life again things are good like I feel better and I'm crying and stuff right now but uh yeah <laughs> that's my personal one so <laughs> yeah perfect thanks <laughs> yeah um so since since that really things have been like i'm crying because i'm like so happy how how good my life has been since then and i'll like always preach the benefits of medical marijuana to people and like yeah anyway <laughs> yeah. yeah no absolutely um what do you think um, like you don't have to go into it or whatever, and but if you want to say even a few words about if you think your experience overseas did it change your opinion of the military or did did your experience overseas have anything to do with why you uh, got out or do you want to say even a word or two about why you got out or was it just time for you you can say um, as much or as little as you want about it obviously well there was like there was multiple reasons that I got out um, part of it was the unbeknownst like ptsd and shit that i had and that i was suffering with um and other uh, like it was like it was stressful being there all the time obviously being sick and not knowing that i was sick i didn't know why i couldn't handle the stress and i was just i was also really over um getting called in at three in the morning and getting yelled at because my fucking spare pair of boots weren't polished right up to the top of the ankle or the or or my laces weren't done up right you know what i mean i had felt like I had done my dues by going to Afghanistan and shit. I didn't need to be. I understand that the military like is a machine that works a certain way, but I think that they have to change how they deal with people that once they come back from Afghanistan, obviously, you know what I mean? Uh, anyway, and also my career had was heading into a point that I didn't want it to. Um, it was a lot more sitting behind the desk and getting uh, doing warrant officer and sergeant work as a corporal and not getting recognized for it. Like 
I was just doing a lot more paperwork and office work. I didn't want to be there for that reason. Again, like I was struggling. Things were tough for me emotionally. I just, it wasn't, it wasn't a healthy, stable environment for me to be in. And I finally recognized that I, with my illness, couldn't sustain that lifestyle. Well, that's, that's what it boils, boils down to. I guess I couldn't continue living like that. It was, I could stay in the army and die in an early grave of like an aneurysm or I'll go crazy and fucking kill someone or something like that or alcoholism hey. or I could get out of the military and take care of myself. So that's what I did. Fair enough. Yeah. yeah. Would you, uh, again, I know that you have, I'm not going to pretend like we don't know each other or whatever. Yeah, so yeah. I know that you have uh, some friends and other people that got out. Can you, not to speak for other people, but do you have some idea why other guys went out and other guys who went on tour, if they went out, if they got out for, if any reasons why you think people get out, or if people just get tired of it? I mean, Um, just you have friends who got out, so what's your impression? Some of them got out because they were just tired of military life, tired, like what I had discussed with some of them, that they were tired of the bullshit, like after being, going to Afghanistan and doing their job, literally, man, getting called in three, four in the morning, Getting yelled at because your name tag from basic training was still sewed on a piece of kit that you haven't used since basic training. You know what I mean? It was still clean and you washed it every time you turned your kit around and blah, blah, blah. But it was a name tag that was sewed on it so you would get extra duties and have to go to work. Like, what the fuck is that, dude? I just go back from fighting a war, settle now. Pick on somebody, pick on a rookie that doesn't know what he's doing. I've got this. Um, so some of them got out for like reasons like that. But I do know a couple of my friends, very close friends, uh, that got out for similar reasons to me. And even a couple of them were suffering from even worse PTSD and shit than I was and couldn't handle it, couldn't hack it. Um, Some of them say they weren't getting the proper help or whatever in the military. I don't know anything about that. But they got out because they couldn't deal with their condition and being in the military at the same time. There was no way they could do it. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Do you want to tell us just a little bit about, like, what you do now, like, just for a living or whatever you, or kind of what you, you don't have to, but you can say what you, what you work at or what your hobbies are or whatever, just kind of what you're, what you're up to lately? Um, well, like, I'm still, well, like, I'm a lot better than I was, obviously, but I am obviously, that's twice I said it, um, uh, I still have. PTSD and MDD and anxiety issues and stuff. I'm not cured by any means. Uh, so my day to day, it's it's different every day. But in general, I guess let's say like on a good day, I'll get up and I'll like go kick tires at the shop with dad and see how things are going over there and see if he needs a hand with anything. And then I come back and like um, I'll do a workout. Uh, I just like to keep busy and keep up around the house, maintain. I built a I built a camp all last summer across the, uh, on my property that I have here. Uh, I'm just using this time, I guess, to like heal and get better and try and get back into the norm of things. Uh, so I keep busy. I did renovations on my house, like I said, and put a home gym in. And uh, I just like to build things and keep active and stay outdoors. And like, I'm looking into building greenhouses and I've become a lot more natural, like a, of a naturalist and I really preach like the, the praises of medical marijuana and the goodness of nature and getting outside to people. And um, like I said, also partially from Afghanistan, what it's taught me is to have that like, it's like hold on to things that are important to you. And I think that human interaction is a thing that's important that not a lot of people do because of technology. So I've been like pushing technology out of my life because that stresses me out and just trying to connect with people more and talk to people more and. I don't know, just live and be a human and yeah. uh, be nice to people. I don't know, it's cool. <laughs> Do you tell people that you're a veteran? Like, what's their, well, like, their kind of reaction? <clears throat> yeah, I don't know. I don't, uh, I, don't, I don't go around in public being like, I'm a veteran, <laughs> everyone, you know what I mean? Um, but I, if it comes up or whatever, like, oh, well, what do you do? Like, when I first, I guess it came up more when I first left the military, um people say oh what do you do when i first moved back home and i'd be like oh well i'm a veteran and i'm just coming oh a veteran like what do you mean uh oh well, i was in, i was in the military oh that's nice you were in the army like they they, they didn't know 
a lot of them didn't know what I was there. Like, what do you mean? Literally, I got asked, what do you mean, a veteran? Um, by the people around here, even young people like, oh, yeah. Uh, and then, actually, it was more common in young people when you say you're a veteran. Be like, oh, did, did you go to Afghanistan, man? Like, yeah, yeah, I went to Afghanistan, dude. Um, but, sorry, I lost in my not medicated brain. What was the original well, I would, no, pretty much. yeah, okay. no, it was basically like, what's your, uh, exp- or what's your impression of the o- awareness? Of- oh yeah. People. Yeah. Yeah. If you want me to generally, yeah, yeah. people don't know, man, a lot of more often than not. Um, some people in Plash Rock are better now because there's a small tight knit legion in there. Um, so they sort of know, but anywhere other than that, that doesn't have like a military core. It's. Some people don't even know there was a war. What war? You know what I mean? Oh, you know, the biggest one that Canada's been involved in since World War II, where the most soldiers have died, that war. Um, yeah, it's, it's people don't know, and the people that do know don't know what they're like. Oh, we were just there for the oil, weren't we? Or like, and I'm always like, I don't know. Or like, some of them were like, did you get him? Like, did you get who? Like, did you get Osama bin Laden? Like, oh. Yeah, we got him. Like, I don't know. What do you say? You know what I mean? It's just people are uninformed. So, I mean, I don't know if it's supposed to be like that with a military operation or whatever, but nobody knows anything about it. That's the easiest way. To, the mo- and that's obviously I'm generalizing. People know so- Some people know some things about it, but really everyone I talked to was like, what's a war? Like, what's a battle? You know what I mean? Um... Yeah, they don't know why we we're there or that we were there or what we we're there for. It's oil or oil or Osama bin Laden is what a lot of the people think. Or uh, Iraq. Iraq is a big one. I forgot to mention when I was talking about people when you're like, uh, oh, yeah, like I'm a veteran or whatever when it comes up. Oh, oh did you go to Iraq? Like, oh, I, I was the only Canadian there. Yes. <laughs> Not really. We had a couple of guys there like as whatever. But yeah. No, yeah, I I was there. That was me in Iraq with the American Army. It's, it's stuff like that. You know what I mean? All in all, I got to say, too, I, I guess I should sum up like a little bit with uh, it. It At the end of the day, because people are always like when I tell stories about me, like having PTSD and the shit that I had to deal with and do. And like I complained about the army. Um, I have people like, oh, the, the goddamn army are pieces of shit. Like, fuck them. You know what I mean? But. I always like to dial people back and say, listen, at the end of the day, I fucking signed the dotted line. I did join up with the army. So, yeah, it's fucked how people get lost in the system or get mistreated or get undiagnosed. But that could happen anywhere. So it's not completely fair to blame blame it all on the army. Um, um, so I'd like to say that. And I, but on the other side of the coin, I would like to say I'm not defending the military either. I think that there should be some better works in process to help diagnose guys and to help them feel like they're not uh, their careers and stuff won't suffer if they have a mental illness or suffered a mental illness while serving overseas or whatever. So uh, I don't know. I just want to get those two points out there, I guess. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was. And also, it wasn't another thing since I got the microphone. Um, it like it wasn't all bad there you know what i mean like i said to you guys when i was talking um some of that shit was sweet like you know what i mean sometimes it is fucking cool to see like big badass explosions going off or fucking shooting rocket launchers and blowing mountains up or blowing mines up or whipping grenades like that stuff's pretty cool but yeah that's just those are like the small the small joys that you got to take out of it right the happiness that you got to remember in it very good then <laughs> uh, any zany catchphrases that you were hoping would take off <laughs> uh, I was going to say oh, I'm a love a dub dub <laughs> get swifty yeah get, uh, get swifty <laughs> if this goes somewhere and the creator Rick and Morty sees this you rule <laughs> shit on the floor anyway <laughs> alright okay I don't know I don't, I don't have anything else uh, that's obviously everything that happened to you before during and after Afghanistan and that's since- it <laughs> All of it, yeah. No, That's the sorry. complete story up uh-huh. to this point. Yep. Okay, stop quick. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, that was good then. <laughs>